1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hereto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are, are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paul of Apollos, are ye not carnal? For who, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Thank you, Brother Daniel, for reading the passage from God's Word today. We're so thankful that we have young men that can do that. When I was your age, let's say I, I, I don't remember if I did it, but I, I was probably very hesitant to do it. I was pretty shy at that time. But um, we're thankful, thankful also for Brother Danny, the songs he led, and also Brother Philip for that good prayer. Brother Philip, I appreciate that very much. I wanted to talk today about God gave the increase. You know, Paul wrote this first letter to the church at Corinth about 57, 58 A.D. while he was at Ephesus. And uh, the Corinthian church had many spiritual, miraculous gifts of the Spirit, but they still suffered from many problems. They had divided into factions or sects, S-E-T-S, each following a different preacher. Immorality was tolerated in the church. There were problems with the observance of the Lord's Supper. Some had a mistaken view of the resurrection of the dead. And yet, though they possessed many miraculous gifts, they were spiritually immature, as Paul calls them carnal, verse 3 of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Paul reminds them that he was an apostle of Christ and has the mind of Christ, chapter 2, verse 16. But still there was discord and division that caused many people not to grow. And in this passage that Brother Daniel read a moment ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul gives some principles, I believe, for the church growth, both spiritually as, as well as numerically. You know, today, many congregations of the Lord's people are concerned about numerical growth. We seem to think in this country that the bigger is the better. That we're, I guess you'd call that pragmatism. Oh, it must work because there's a lot of people there. Not necessarily so. Are those, Christ, are those congregations growing or are they just swelling? So we need to return to the Bible and find some of the divine principles for church growth. Well, the most important principle, I think, is that the proper seed must be sown. You know, the Bible tells us the seed of the kingdom is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. It is not some philosophy. It's not some self-help book. It's not some devotional book or some experience someone had. The seed of the kingdom is the Word of God. Colossians 2, verse 8, Paul said, Take heed, uh, lest there shall be any one that make a spoil or captures you through his philosophy and vain deceit, after tradition of men, after rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Paul said, Beware of that. 
Another thing that's not the seed of the kingdom, seed of the kingdom is not friendliness or fellowship in There's nothing wrong with either one of those. But many brethren seem to think that is the way for a church to grow, is to be friendlier. Well, yeah, we should all be friendly. Or we should all have more potlucks. And uh, I know a congregation not around here that every Wednesday they have a big meal together. Or they have a meal where you can come in before Bible study and all like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But is that the way, is that the seed of the kingdom? Romans 14, verse 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. My friends, the seed of the kingdom is not the largest building in town. Or to add on to a gymnasium to your town, what does somebody call a family life center? I think that's one of the terms. What does verse 9 of our text say, 1 Corinthians 3? It says, ye, or they say in the south, you all are God's building. You are God's building. We are the church. Not some big edifice. The Word of God, my friends, the Bible only, produces Christians only and the only Christians. We must remember that. Let me repeat it. The Bible only produces Christians only and the only Christians. I read several years ago about in the Jordan River Valley in Israel, they were doing some excavating there and they came across a small pot in some ruin somewhere. And within it there were some date seeds. You know, a date palm produces dates. And they, uh, one of them said, well, this one looks pretty good. So he planted it. It grew up and it produced watermelons. Right? No. It produced dates. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Matthew 11, verse 23. And he, uh, and, and he that was sown upon the good ground, this is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, who verily beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundred souls, some sixty, some thirty. Notice, heareth the word, not heareth some testimony, or heareth some uh, emotional plea, but he heareth the word. You know, it's interesting how Paul called the Corinthian brethren spiritual babes, and carnal or immature because they had not grown spiritually as well. Now, that wasn't Paul's fault. He had planted the right seed. In chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, verse 13, he says, <clears throat> Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. But they had not grown they were still immature. That seed had not grown. No brethren today, the church of our Lord, cannot grow without sowing the seed and eating the bread. What does that mean? John 6, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh me shall not hunger. Do we feed of that word, do we free, feed of the bread of life? Jesus Christ. Are we in fellowship with Him? That's how you grow. Another thing that this passage points out is found in verse 4 and 5. Unless you refresh our memory on that. It says, For a while one saith, I am a Paul, another one, I am a Paulus. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe even as the Lord gave to every man? My friends, the another way God gives the increase way is the realization that every Christian is a minister. You know, the Corinthians had developed what you might call a pastor system. You see this in the denominations a lot today. Oh, the, the preacher basically is the big guy. Oh, he the thing kind of, everything kind of whirls around him. I remember many years ago, a small town I grew up in, southeastern New Mexico, a long way from there. <laughs> anyway, there was a, a Second Baptist Church. I didn't know there was that. 
No, uh, Second Baptist Church <clears throat> had a guy there brought in a preacher, and boy, he could strum the guitar and he could sing, and he was real likable. And man, the thing just grew, grew, grew. And then one day he ran off with the secretary, and the whole thing went pfft, down like that. That's the pastor system. What does the Bible say about that? First Corinthians chapter one, verse twelve and thirteen. Now this I say, Paul said, that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I am a Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul scoffs at that idea of following a man. Brethren, it is a sin to maintain some sort of clergy laity system relationship where the preacher is up there on top or whoever it may be, and everybody else is down there somewhere. And, uh, you know, you're, they, they put, you're up on a pinnacle somewhere. Because that's not the divine pattern. Let's look at the divine pattern a little bit. Over in Matthew chapter 20. Here Jesus uttered these words. As soon as I get to him, Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. He says, Paul said unto them, and said, You know the princes of Gentiles exercise authority, dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to minister, to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. That's the right relationship. All are ministers. Matthew 23, verse 8. Paul, uh, the Lord lays down this. He says, Be not called rabbi, for one is your teacher, for all of you are for all ye are brethren. Call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father, even he who is in heaven. Our, our friends of the Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> haven't read this verse, apparently. Call mo no man your father. My friends, all Christians should be ministers. All Christians, for example, should spread the gospel. Sometimes we isolate the preacher and say, well, he'll do that. He'll do that. In some denominations, it's she'll do that. But anyway, in the Lord's church, they'll say, he'll do that. No, no. Notice again, Matthew 28, verse 18, the Great Commission, where Paul says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice, Go ye, as in the south we'd say, go you all. All of you go. All of you go. Not just the apostles. Not just the preachers. Everybody. All Christians should do that. Another important thing. All Christians should edify one another. If they don't go, oh, the preacher does that. They build up. Yeah? Yeah? Well, the preacher should do that, build up. But all should edify. Galatians 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear ye one another's burdens. All Christians, my friends, should visit those in need and help them. It's, it's kind of hard to do that nowadays because of all this virus going on, but we should do that. Visit those in need and help them. Not just one group, or not just one uh, like the so-called Church of Christ is asked to relief, which is, is not found in the Bible. All Christians should visit those in need and help them. James 1 verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the fathers and the widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unspotted from the word. My friend, the devil triumphs when the individual Christian fails to understand who he or she is. That we are all ministers, all followers of Jesus Christ. As Peter would say in 2 Peter 2 verse 5, Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. 
to offer up spiritual sacrifice except for God through Jesus Christ. Lord willing, we've done that today in our singing, in our praying. So, God gives the increase. How does He do that? He does that, he does that through us. But another important point is found out in verse 6 and 7 of our text. Let's look at it again. Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that's given the increase. Important point, folks. God gives the increase. You know, some churches today, congregations, look upon the world for their definition of success. Oh, we have this large, luxurious facility to meet in. Nothing's wrong with that. But if that's, your, if that's the kingdom for you, you've got problems. If you look on that as success, you've got problems. You know, our spiritual ancestors, our forebears, met in a shack across the tracks. Well, some of mine did. Many, oh, to be successful, you've got to have many programs which meet everyone's felt needs. Oh, we've got this program, we've got that program. I've even, I've, I've seen where you had a minister of the parking lot. <laughs> I don't know what he does, but I guess he directs people where they park. All these different ministry, ministry oh, we're successful, look what we're doing. Or, you know, be successful to increase you must have an articulate, funny, interesting minister, preacher, whose sermons are short and sweet. As one old brother used to tell me, some Christians won't want a, a preacherette smoke a, a two uh, to preach a sermonette so they can run outside and smoke a cigarette. <laughs> That's an old joke. That's my joke for the day. Okay. But notice what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. Paul prophesying here says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears will keep to themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and turn aside unto fables. Now, that doesn't sound like too many funny stories in that, does it? All these things look to men for success and not to God. They look to men, oh, what have they done to be successful? Not what God says to increase. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5, Paul says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Brethren, it was not Paul or Apollos who gave the increase in Corinth, but it was God. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul emphasizes this in verse 1. He said, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching <clears throat> was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of of the spirit of power, that your faith should not stand the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Too many today do not take heed to that verse, and they look upon the church. Well, how, you know, is your is your preacher this way? Do you have all these programs? Do you have all that? Then you're successful. If not, you're somewhere else. Somewhere. Then you're inferior somewhere. Brother, it's not our programs. It's not our preaching. It's not our efforts which cause the kingdom of God to increase, but God does that. He causes that word germinate. He causes that word to bear fruit. As long as we're doing God's will, we should not be concerned about numbers and worldly ideas of success. Never forget that only eight people got in that ark when the world was destroyed by water. Eight out of the probably millions that lived back then. James 4 verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall exalt you. Notice that. 
Oh, exalt yourself and the Lord will exalt you. No, humble yourself inside the Lord and He will exalt you. In verse 14, 15 of James 4, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, what is your life? For you are a vapor that appeareth for a little while, for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall both live and do this or that. Yeah, brother one say, oh, we've got this grand plan where we're going to do all this and increase and be bigger and better, uh, so forth and so on. If the Lord wills, as long as God gets the glory, it does not matter who sows the seed or waters the field. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever read again in, about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? The Lord tapped a fellow on the shoulder there in Damascus named Ananias. The only time you hear about Ananias is this part of the Bible. And look what he did. He baptized Saul, Paul, that would become the Apostle Paul. What a great achievement. Yet, Paul would become so much more than Ananias ever was. Did that make Ananias inferior? No. How about an Aquila and Priscilla? Here was this man came in, Apollos spoke eloquently of Christ, but he was wrong on doctrinal things. They took him aside very quietly and taught him the truth. And he implies, implies there he changed, he repented, and did what was right. And became great in church. Paul mentions him later on. Now, what about Aquila and Priscilla? Those people that serve the Lord. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If any man speaketh, if any man speaketh, speaking as the oracles of God, if any man ministereth, minister as the strength which God supplieth, when in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Another point about Christian growth. Christian unity brings growth. Verse 8 of our text. It says. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. My friends, true unity comes from a love of Christ in the world. True unity realized that I'm not on that cross. Jesus Christ was on that cross. That's where unity comes from. John 14, verse 21, Jesus says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved to my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Remember, Christ died on that cross for me. Make it personal. That's where unity comes from. True unity also comes from a shared love for the lost. Brethren, we must love the lost and bring them in. Bring them to the Lord. Isaiah 55, verse 6, 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. How our world needs that verse this morning. James 5, verse 19 and 20. James says, My brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know. And that's talking about a Christian bringing another Christian back who's been unfaithful. If one convert him, let him know that he who converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. How often, you know, I've, I've, and I think I've mentioned this before, Ever, every congregation I've been a part of or visited or anything, I would imagine if everybody was there that should have been there, in other words, the place would be full. And that's true anywhere. So many brethren today are unfaithful to the Lord. True unity comes from a shared love for the kingdom of, of God, the church of Christ. True love. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul goes even farther. And he describes that great love as the, similar to a love between a man and his wife. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forth, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. True unity is that shared love for that church that the Lord died for. My friends, unity also brings growth. When one is united, many people ask today, well, why isn't the church growing? Why? One reason is they're not united in one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Acts 8, verse 4, They therefore that were scared abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. Preaching the Word. Over in verse 8 again of our text in verse uh, of chapter 3, it says the latter part, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Growth comes from working towards the reward. The reward. Brethren, this reward is not earthly. This reward, as Brother Danny brought out in the class this morning, is eternal. Eternal life. <clears throat> then shall the king say unto them, they're on the right hand, the great judgment seat. Come, ye blessed of my father, <clears throat> inherit the king prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on. And that reward is gained by an all-consuming desire to do God's will. To do God's will. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they love not their life even unto death. I'll never forget my grandmother. She's been gone many years now. I'm a faithful member of the Lord's humble servant. After she buried my grandfather the same day she came home from that funeral, and that evening she got on the, home, on the phone and started inviting people to the gospel meeting that will be next week. That is a true love in working for the Lord. But you know, sometimes, folks, there are those who don't allow God to give the increase. Let's just look at a few this morning. One was Abraham and Sarah. Have you ever read about Abraham and Sarah? They tried to help God out in Genesis chapter 16. God promised them a, a, an heir, Abraham was an heir, and uh, it didn't come, so they said, well, they, well, we'll just make Hagar will be Abraham's wife, second wife. And of course, they had Ishmael, and both of them had to leave eventually Ishmael and Hagar. We see about Israel, ancient Israel, who tried repeatedly to be like their neighbors that we've been studying on Wednesday night in the book of 2 Kings. As they told Samuel so long ago, make us a king to judge us like all the nations when they already had a king. It was, it was God. What about the Sadducees of Jesus' day? Tried to help out God. Tried to compromise Help out Israel and be like the Greeks and the Romans around them. What did Jesus say? No man can serve two masters. You've got to either serve the Lord or you can't serve the Lord in the world. You must serve God alone. About the church at Sardis. In Revelation chapter 3, there the apostle tells us, or Jesus actually tells us, Revelation 3, verse 1. He says, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou art, livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which there remain. Now, notice what he says there. You have a name that you're alive, but I see you as dead. I see you as dead, Jesus said. Some congregations today of the Lord's people may seem alive, but they are spiritually dead. They want to try gimmicks to bring people in. Now I've said this before, you could probably tape a twenty dollar a couple of twenty dollar bills under all these seats and announce it somewhere, maybe in the media. Well not maybe not today because of the of the virus, but on other days you could have you could have the place full. Would that would that be an increase? No. It wouldn't be an increase. Or they have open membership. Just let anybody in. 
long as you halfway claim that you believe in Jesus, let you in. We'll let you in. We'll we'll fellowship you. Or they'll say, oh, we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs tonight. Everybody come. Well, as one friend said many years ago, he takes hamburgers and hot dogs to get them in. He'll take hamburgers and hot dogs to keep them there too. God does not want us to compromise the truth for the sake of numbers. He's not wanting us to compromise that truth. We must preach the gospel. As Brother Marshall Keeble says, when they lack it, when they don't lack it. That's true. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. How true that is today. True unity in, in, comes by doing God's Word. Proper growth, both spiritually and and collectively as a body of Christ comes by this commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. There may be here someone here this morning who is not part of that, not part of God's husbandry, God's building. The Bible tells us how we may correct that. Number one, we need to learn that truth, John 8, verse 32. We need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 20, verse 31. When you repent of all our sins, Acts 17, verse 30. We need to baptize, be, confess rather Jesus as the Christ, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, and be baptized with Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2, verse 38. To rise up to walk in newness of life, in unity, going, aim towards heaven. Maybe you have done that and you've fallen away. Maybe you've not been where you are. Ask God that's where you're sitting to forgive you. Or maybe you brought reproach on His kingdom. You need to come forward today and ask forgiveness. Not only God, but of His church, His brother. If this is your need this morning, please come as we stand and say it. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me
<coughs> sing first, third, and the fifth verse. Mm. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper pain I see, then thought I go to Thee, garden of Gethsemane. When my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I see, Christian represents his body that was offered on our behalf. We pray that as we partake of this, that we'll direct our minds back to that time when he suffered for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy high and holy name. Help us as we partake of this fruit of vine. Remember your son's love for us and how he went up Calvary and gave his life for us. Help us to partake of this fruit of the vine in remembrance of your dear son, which represents his bloody shed for us. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Bow once again, please. Father, as we come to another portion of the worship service today, as we lay by in store as thou hast prospered us, we pray that we would give cheerfully. And we pray, Heavenly Father, we give sacrificially that these and we pray that these funds will be used in the wisest way for the cause of thy kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. so many that are using the wrong things to try to bring people to the Lord and to the kingdom. I appreciate that good sound lesson that he brought. Let's sing number 32, the first and the last verse. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee.